afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first director seminar of the year at the Institute for Global Prosperity at UCL. I'm delighted that you're all joining us. I'm uh, Professor Henrietta Moore. I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Global Prosperity. And these occasions are a lot of fun. They're an occasion to hear some ideas and your job in the audience is to listen and then to join in the debate. So the way that they run is that there's a short introduction by me, then there is the presentation by the speaker. And after that presentation finishes, there's a few minutes of discussion between me and the speaker, which is just to give you enough time to work out what the best question is. And then the floor is open to you. And those questions will come to me on the chat and I will read them out and then we will debate. So welcome again. So this afternoon, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker, Dr. Ruth Yeoman, who is fellow of Kellogg College, University of Oxford. And Ruth's work is really important because she works on the theory and idea of meaningful work, on workplace democracy, on things like values and ethical supply chain management, on mutuality and on integrated healthcare systems. She's applied her ideas and worked with small and public private sector organizations. She was a lead consultant for the cabinet office in 2015, and she led a collaboration, including the Bank of England and the Office of National Statistics, investigating the role of intangible assets in national wealth creation. She's also served as a member of the Treasury Council of Economic Advisors in the UK. So we're delighted to welcome Ruth this afternoon. And her talk is entitled Rebuilding Economics Post-COVID. So given the risks facing humanity and our planet, post-COVID recovery has to be values led. It has to be a recovery that's green, that's resilient, that's inclusive. And Ruth talks about the values and concepts that's going to underpin this necessary rebuilding process. And in all of that, a very neglected dimension is our human need for meaning in work and life. And so she's going to talk to us this afternoon about how meaningfulness can inform our economic models of human behavior and also give us some kind of ethical guidance for the kind of economy we want. So let's turn now and hear Dr. Yeoman's presentation. I'm delighted to be with you all today. My thanks to Professor Henrietta Moore and her colleagues for the invitation to speak. In talking about post-COVID economic recovery, I claim no special originality. Rather, my aim is to show you that we already have everything we need for a good post-COVID recovery. And with this in mind, I've made it my task to knit existing ideas together to aid our collective reflections. Writing in the New Yorker magazine, the science fiction author Kim Stanley Robinson said that COVID-19 is rewriting our imaginations of what is possible. And we have indeed become amazed by what it now seems possible for governments to do. Confronted with the breakdown of productive economies around the world, governments have created fiscal support packages for workers, businesses and public services, as well as promoted technologies to monitor the health of populations and provided funds for global vaccine development. This activity is shifting the relationship between governments, citizens and economies. We don't know yet how this is all going to end up. But the flux of change and anxiety is creating opportunities to realise long-held dreams of a civilising and humane economy. Multiple national and international institutions have endorsed a green, resilient and inclusive recovery, including, for example, the Council of Europe, OECD, World Bank and United Nations. This aspiration extends to businesses, investors and sector organisations. On the 15th of September, 164 chief executives signed a letter calling for the EU to set a 2030 greenhouse emission target of at least 55%. What is being called for is an economic recovery left, led by ethical values, values that are also stabilizing for complex human civilization upon the earth. Professor Peter Wells and colleagues described the COVID-19 pandemic as a catalytic meta-transition event in its scale, pace and pervasiveness. 
the pandemic has revealed systemic weaknesses in our societies and a values-led recovery calls for society-wide learning to address these fragilities, one that draws upon the contributions of all members. The UK is my particular focus, but in so doing I bring forward general concepts relevant to all kinds of economies. I argue that economics as an academic discipline and as a real-world practice could benefit from considering the importance to people of meaningfulness in life and in work. Attending to meaningfulness is especially relevant for post-COVID recovery that must define the shape of lives that can be lived in the Anthropocene under the pressures of climate heating. For many countries, including the UK, unpreparedness has brought already existing features such as technological shifts and underinvestment in public services vividly to our attention. The UK is burdened by entrenched social and political fissures, communities of the left behind, uneven wealth distribution, short termism in public investment, precarious jobs and indeed no jobs at all with forgotten and voiceless workers. And that is without taking into account imminent Brexit disruptions. Whole sectors are about to be upended. The UK logistics industry has 10 new systems it must adopt by January 2021, with potentially 215 million additional customs declarations per year. In the UK, getting ready for sustainability transitions involves not only recovering from pandemic-induced economic shutdowns, but also attending to chronic low productivity and poor quality work, none of which, of course, will be settled by Brexit. From Leicester garment factories to modern slavery, the UK economy contains work that is exploitative and degrading. If justice in economic recovery is to mean anything at all, it must mean coming to see one another more clearly and with more respect for the contributions made by others to our individual and collective well-being. This implies building into economic recovery policies that address the character of work, sustainability of income, and human capability development. As the pandemic has unfolded, we have failed to see our connectedness to those who are socially and economically marginalised, and this is having political impact. Rather than climate strike, the protests on the streets at the moment are of Black Lives Matter and mobilisations for democracy. But calls for rights and for voice for mutual respect, equal treatment and fair opportunities to lead a good life do not sit apart from economic systems, since these systems can mediate or crush hopes for more socially inclusive societies. And we have seen how authoritarian regimes or centralising democracies do less well during the course of the pandemic. Such societies close off warnings, information flows and shared knowledge building so we also need a renaissance of democratic governance that coheres the various parts of organised society, supported by a truth-seeking culture and expert institutions. With respect to economic strategy formation, I concentrate on the rebuilding part of Build Back Better, arguing for an inclusive rebuilding process that involves many voices, perspectives, contributions and energies. In particular, I argue that investments in humanity are just as important as investments in infrastructure, technology and production. Such investments were recently called for in Greater Manchester's Independent Prosperity Review. And Greater Manchester is also mobilising around a good employment charter, which is not far short of a citywide good work index. With this in mind, I recall what the philosopher John Dewey said that we ought to pride ourselves upon a practical idealism, a lively and easily moved faith in possibilities yet unrealised, in willingness to make sacrifices for their realisation. In his strategy of economic development, Albert Hirschman describes a dynamic economy as akin to maintaining an endlessly spinning cobweb involving calling forth and enlisting for development purposes resources and abilities that are scattered, hidden or badly utilised. Creating industrial policy and economic strategy out of dispersed and disconnected resources is a political act, one that requires organisational capabilities from government. 
It is also a human and an expressive act. But people, their agency and contributions, are often left out of our models of economic organising. Economic systems and organisations are assumed to be either automatically emergent or created by managerial and expert elites. This blind spot is shared by other disciplines. For example, in sustainability transitions, Upman and colleagues argue that individual perspectives and contributions are neglected, and they urge us to consider actor-driven approaches beyond consumption. We are not only consumers or behavioural units, but also workers, citizens, friends, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters. Investing in humanity means ensuring that people in their various social roles have the human capabilities for contributing to rebuilding processes, where the aim is a green, resilient and inclusive economy. This means enabling people to contribute so they can live well within planetary boundaries, whilst also caring for other beings and things that matter to them. For this task, people need voice in decision making, a say in what Albert Hirschman describes as formulating the economic choice set that provides a collective vision for the future. If we have seen anything from COVID-19, it is that people, people are capable of remarkable feats of organising. But this capacity is negle neglected in public policy. We need an enriched view of human beings and what they can do, and we need more of their initiative if our societies are to become more resilient to future shocks. Engaging all of the talents requires an institutional framework that connects human capabilities to economy-wide processes of structural change. As multiple systems transition in parallel, we need to consider human capabilities in relation to the diversity of sectors and their interconnections, their existing knowledge bases and related policy challenges. Beyond the national level, we need to strengthen international institutions such as the G20 within a system of global power for cooperation and mutual development. Without the integration of individual and organisational capabilities with sectoral interconnections and global collaboration, national efforts to navigate future challenges will be weakened. The general call is to build back better, but what kind of economy is better? I start with this proposal for a provisioning, provisioning economy from Narotsky and Besnier. They describe provisioning as making a living is about making people. It is about struggles and stabilisation around the worth of people and how to make life worth living. We provision one another with what we need to lead lives that we value. Jeff Noonan describes life value as being rooted in that which is required to maintain and develop life and its sentient, cognitive, imaginative and creative practical capacities. At a fundamental level, we need to bring together ethics and economics. Professor Julie Nelson says that if we are to survive and flourish as a species as well as individuals, we have to act as whole people body and soul together. A values-led economic recovery, one that has life provisioning as a core purpose, could benefit from considering our human need for meaning and our capacity for meaning making. This suggests that building back better needs to move into some unfamiliar territory for economic policy. In particular, we need to consider how people experience the economy in their relationships and emotional attachments. For example, in the aftermath of Brexit and the rise of popular politics, we have become preoccupied with a concern for how economics, policies and practices have undercut people's sense of belonging. The philosopher Simone Weil says that to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognised need of the human soul. But belonging is a complex experience. The word belonging is derived from longan, the Old English to go, to go along with and to relate to. This suggests that belonging is dynamic, a form of travelling together that is mutable and changeable. At the heart of belonging is a tension and a contradiction. Home is always in flux. As a dwelling or gathering of people, home is temporary, episodic. 
We need to reimagine belonging as expansive and nested. Everyone comes from somewhere, lives and works somewhere, has connections to many different places. To successfully negotiate belonging, we need a sense of agency, of being able to successfully shape the circumstances of our lives. In the context of sustainability transitions, we need to act upon our agency to create belonging with an ethical and ecological sensibility of all those beings and things that must dwell together. I argue for a whole systems of systems approach to the design of a life provisioning economy, one that includes four systems of economic democracy, societal capabilities, interactional power, and socially valuable contribution. I discuss in particular the building blocks of meaningfulness, resilience, capabilities, meanings and narratives, contributions, and democracy. Picking out the capabilities system, I make our human capabilities part of an integrated system of individual organizational and social capabilities. In economic scholarship, these capabilities are treated separately Amartya Sen's concept of human capabilities for functioning informs development economics. In organisational theory, organisational capabilities are a source of competitive advantage for firms. The economist Moses Abramovitz argues that nations need social capabilities for ec rapid economic growth. But an integrated societal capability system extends beyond the level of the nation state to a capability for contributing to globally relevant challenges. It also expands the notion of work. When work is rooted in our human capability to organise, work is not just jobs, but the varieties of contributions we make to social cooperation. Work becomes a resourceful aspect of how we respond to risks such as the climate emergency that also gives us a sense of meaning and purpose. In values-led economic recovery, we can create sources of life meaning by linking the varieties of our contributions to our responsibilities for earth stewarding. Through the creation of narratives that are connected to earth stewarding, such meaning sources can be disseminated to become universally available for people to draw upon when reflecting upon their contributions to socially progressive objectives. So, before looking more closely at what we are learning during the pandemic, I do a quick introduction to the possibilities I think are afforded us by considering meaning in life and in work. I suggest that meaningfulness sensitizes economic models and policymakers to how people actually experience their lives. And also that the ethical model, the ethical value of meaningfulness plays a role in the practical reasoning regarding what we ought to do together to solve complex problems. Meaningfulness has a moral structure that can be described and institutionalized. It provides a reflective standpoint in meaning making, especially the meaning making that we do in contentious and problematic situations. As a moral value and ethical practice that informs collective action, meaningfulness can be designed into organisations and systems to create sustainable, resilient and inclusive models of production. In moral and political philosophy, meaningfulness is a route to well-being and flourishing. Richard Arneson says, nothing that an individual does or gets contributes in itself to her well-being unless the thing is both objectively valuable and positively engages her subjectivity. Similarly, the moral philosopher Susan Wolfe says that the moral value of meaningfulness combines objective and subjective dimensions. The objective dimension is related to being involved with something that is of independent value and significance, the subjective dimension to finding that involvement emotionally engaging and attractive. More recently, Andrea Veltman has argued that the prospects for life meaning are tied to being able to exercise human capabilities in complex work. With this in mind, in my own work, I have proposed that our activities are meaningful when they are structured by goods of meaningfulness, such as autonomy, freedom and dignity, directed towards taking care of beings and things that matter to us, that we judge to be of independent significance and moral value,
and that we also experience as emotionally engaging and worthwhile. At the level of individual psychology, Tatiana Schnell shows that life rich in meaning depends upon being able to access a diversity of meaning sources. Generativity is one of the most important meaning sources that enables a person to integrate different kinds of meanings. The psychologist Eric Erickson described generativity as a concern for guiding, nurturing and establishing the next generation through an act of care. Meaningfulness is interactive and relational. We co-construct with others the experience of meaningfulness from the meanings that underpin our values, narratives, culture and history. Meanings makes the, intelligent, the significance of something intelligible. They allow us to interpret and understand the world and to integrate our relationship to other beings and things. They are a resource for narrative formation and dissemination where narratives are built up from networks of values and meanings. Where there is an abundance of sign meaning, people are afforded deliberative resources for working together on complex problems. Meaning sources are a type of wealth, a type of intangible asset for creating and crafting life meaning. When incorporated into economics, the value of meaningfulness can help us to take account of a broader range of motivations and to enrich our models of human behaviour. In an intriguing paper, Carlson and colleagues on the economics of meaning propose that meaning and its capacity to impact on behaviour is related to opportunities to make free choices, reducing uncertainty about preferences, seeking higher meaning and making sense of the world. As meaning makers, we translate meanings into a sense of meaningfulness through processes of mobilising and governing meanings. In a citizen-led study of three East London neighbourhoods, Moore and Root Woodcraft found that local meanings of what does it mean for everyone to prosper diverged from economic models of, mater of material prosperity and placed greater emphasis on belonging, voice and relationships. Such meanings have the potential to be activated for mobilising local collective action and for informing city level governance. With respect to the mobilisation of meanings, in collective action, our everyday acts of coordination are saturated with meanings that have the potential to travel up and into public meaning making. With respect to the governance of meanings, not all meanings are ethically viable and we need public evaluation to judge between different meanings. Governance of meanings is an aspect of a society's development and inclusiveness that requires participation and debate between society's members. Returning to COVID-19 and economic recovery, the pandemic has required us to reflect upon what and who we value and how we organise to take care of beings and things that matter to us. We have become acutely aware of our dependence upon those willing to work in the caring and provisioning economies and during the COVID-19 crisis to put themselves in harm's way for our sake. Our failure to properly see the people who do such work has put the whole system in jeopardy. We can no longer afford the costs of invisible members of our society who, in John Dewey's words, having no share in society, society has none in them. The pandemic has disrupted all at once multiple interconnected systems. Even so, we have learnt that we have not lost our human capacity for self-organisation and mutual aid. This challenges clumsy attempts at behavioural science interventions. So whilst UK politicians have lost themselves in a view of citizens as capable only of being nudged and messaged, the organised part of society, in which most of us work, took the initiative to shut down offices, to work from home, to social distance and home school. However, we have also learnt that voluntary responses by private, public and civic organisations have limits in the absence of an orchestrator that can ensure that everyone does their fair share and that the rules binding everyone are observed. There is no going back to normal just to going forward into fresh complexities and challenges. 
the climate emergency has already set in train energy, food and transport transitions to decarbonised economic production that will have a transformative impact upon the ways we live. In an exploration of what we need for economic recovery, a UK parliamentary super inquiry called for a detailed focus on place, including local industrial strategies and place based challenges funds for local public value creation, spending on capabilities including governance capabilities, more voices in designing the kind of economy we want to build and attention to green transition pathways. Similar proposals are being made all the time at a global level, for example this report of the IMF in June. Investments in humanity will help us to manage complex forms of organising at multiple levels. Such investments also enable people to make socially valuable contributions that give them a sense of meaning and purpose. In 2019, the International Labour Organisation called for a human-centred approach for increasing investment in people's capabilities, in the, invest in the institutions of work and in decent and sustainable jobs for the future. This means focusing on the quality of work so that a jobs rich recovery is also a rich jobs recovery where jobs include voice, dignity and autonomy. Creating rich jobs means revisiting the dismissal of unskilled jobs that allows us to pretend cleaners, carers and others are not important. This is aided by creating worker democracy in organisations and developing worker capabilities for contributing to joint decision making. COVID-19 provides opportunities to re-evaluate what we have called unskilled work and how such work is part of a meaningful life. But McBride and Lucio show how during the COVID-19 pandemic, cleaning work has become more complex and challenging requiring integrity, self-direction, skill and knowledge of regulations and best practice. Social recognition of such valuable work includes worker entitlements to voice, not only discretion in getting tasks done, but also the ability to shape the organisation itself. Finally, given the climate emergency, our values and identities at work need to become directed to earth stewardship. A societal capabilities system aims at mutual enablement, where we do not develop our capabilities at the expense of others' capabilities. In his work on contributive justice, Paul Gumberg shows that as a matter of justice, we should not limit opportunity, but should make it possible for everyone to contribute. He says, it is unfair to deprive so many of the opportunity to contribute complex capabilities. In a study of agroecological farming in Cuba and Costa Rica, Timmerman and Felix argue for a fairer provision of meaningful work in agriculture and not merely decent work. They say that meaningful work fosters human development through skill formation and the recognition of craft and tacit knowledge. The lack of provision for worthwhile contribution, such as socially valuable work, makes people vulnerable to poor mental and physical health outcomes. In his research on the Glasgow effect, Professor Sir Harry Burns found widespread health inequalities in young and middle-aged people whose families had experienced the disruption of deindustrialization. In a BBC radio interview, Burns argued that the remedy was to tackle the social, environmental and economic dislocation felt by people. He said this would require all the public sector to work together to help people regain a sense of purpose and meaning in life. This would include innovations in social cohesion, which move away from doing things to people rather than doing things with people. Rich jobs are a form of complex contribution that draw from people their skill, craft and knowledge and in return deliver to them the goods of meaningfulness, freedom, autonomy and dignity. Complex societies offer opportunities for meaningful work, but complexity has ambivalent appeal. David Runciman describes the dread of interconnectedness arising from our vulnerability to system level failures that exceed our powers of control. 
Striking a more positive note, Richard Sennett associates the virtues of complexity with the capacity of open systems to generate enriched experiences of living together, as well as the freedom and power to initiate new social, political and economic formations. When connected to struggle, resistance and effort, complexity is developmental, fostering environments that Sennett says are ever richer in meaning. In their Atlas of Economic Complexity, Hausman and colleagues argue that economic complexity as the amount of productive knowledge in a country is linked to rising prosperity. The degree of useful knowledge helps along the processes of social learning that are needed for economic development. And they say, our most prosperous modern societies are wiser, not because their citizens are individually brilliant, but because these societies hold a diversity of know-how and because they are better able to recombine to create a larger variety of smarter and better products. Productivity and rising living standards depend upon learning by doing, or as Solo puts it, learning how to do things better. Applied to poorer countries, Stiglitz argues that an urban industrial sector is better at innovating and generating learning benefits for the rest of the economy. But in the context of the complex transitions needed to navigate climate change, we are all poorer countries. Every country needs to apply learning by doing to socio-technical fields of agriculture, transport and energy. Moreover, every country is hampered by impaired economic justice and failures to invest in its people. Complex economies are not necessarily inclusive economies. Productive knowledge is unevenly distributed within and between countries. Many countries lack the structures and institutions to help them hold on to and combine knowledge. Hausman and colleagues point out that poorly connected communities, such as petroleum, cotton, rice and soybeans, tend to be low in complexity. In a values-led recovery, complexity must be harnessed to an inclusive resilience. People working within interdependent systems need the skills and knowledge to manage complexity, and this task is not merely a technical one. It is also social, requiring engagements with the meanings, values and culture that constitute the ethical wealth of nations. An instructive ex example is the Green Revolution, which at the, time, which at the same time as increasing agricultural productivity, degraded local environments and created social and economic inequalities. Experts tended to oversimplify problems and ignore the diversity of local ecosystems, including culture and values. We should seek to develop socio-technical practices so that they become more complex and deliver more of the goods of meaningfulness. An imaginary of what this might look like is described by Ursula Le Guin in her story, The Fisherman of the Inland Sea. She describes the deep planning of farmer management, a socio-technical practice that is rich in values and meanings that integrates a complexity of factors, ecology, politics, profit, tradition, aesthetics, honour and spirit, all functioning in an intensely practical and practically invisible balance of preservation and renewal, like the homeostasis of a vigorous organism. Such socio-technical practices are constituted by meanings, values and narratives. They are replete with the intangible assets that are needed for rebuilding the provisioning economy. Studies on the future of work show us the importance of the intangible assets of meanings and culture under technological shifts, whilst some occupations will decline, others requiring high levels of social skills and cognitive capacities will grow. In a 2018 study, Bakshi and colleagues show that nearly all US jobs growth since the 1980s has been in occupations high in social skills that supply, as Bakshi says, the tools for the rich and versatile coordination which supports a productive workplace. Since we are human, we cannot help but make culture. In a 2017 study of German manufacturing firms, Bender and colleagues show that high levels of productivity are associated with advanced management practices such as monitoring, goal setting and use of incentives. However, these are mediated through employee decision making and effort. In other words, 
human capital is needed to sustain a high productivity environment. But productivity is not, as Bender puts it, reducible to the atoms of human capital employed in the firm. The successful firm invests in an organisational capability for corporate culture that combines hearts and minds or values, meanings and norms with nuts and bolts or the material assets of the organisation. An intangibles rich organisation is a humanity rich organisation, one that is abundant in the wealth of voices and perspectives using a participatory infrastructure to get information flows to where they need to be so that people can make decisions. Such an organisational entity is resilient and inclusive. Resilience is the ability to absorb change and disturbance, to rebound from adversity. From psychological studies, we know that individuals with a sense of life being meaningful are better equipped to respond when confronted with adversity. Linin Leuker identifies three factors for building resilience in the face of massive external uncertainty. Adaptive business models with the capacity for rapid innovation, resilient global supply chains, and building the strength of employees. Building the strength of employees includes provisioning people with the resources that they need for life meaning. As part of a societal capability system, this extends to voice and a sense of efficacy, a sense of being able to influence the shape of one's life and the circumstances one finds oneself in. Individual and organisational resilience that draws upon life meaning needs meaning sources. Research on a materialist ethics of care offers meaning sources that enlarge our imaginations of our interwovenness with not only other living beings, but also non-material things and natural systems. Jean Liedke says that care concentrates on our capacity to respond to and enact responsibility towards others, to share meanings and find ways of being together in the world. Caring as a moral sensibility involves pooled agency, sharing a commonality of being, an existential feeling of connection and relationship. This aspect of meaning and purpose in life and in work is little considered in social policy, yet it is a core element of resilient systems. Our inter interdependent condition is a source of mutual vulnerability. Galopin refers to vulnerability as the capacity to preserve the structure of a, sit of a system. Vulnerability is related to resilience and adaptive capacity, where the adaptive capacity of a system is the ability to create novelty and learning in response to vulnerabilities. It constitutes the ability of a system to evolve in order to accommodate changes. Creating personal and organisational adaptive capacity facilitates the resilience needed to counter vulnerability. Adaptive capacity involves moral and practical learning, involving a greater understanding of the meanings and values that underpin how we see ourselves in relation to one another and to the world. Moral and practical learning is important for navigating the changes that will come with sustainability transitions. And here I modify Joseph Tainter's reflections on sustainability and resiliency. Sustainability is a form of work by which we maintain what we know and care about as part of lives we value. Resiliency is the capacity for change in response to disturbances that impact the welfare of things that matter to us. Sustainability and resiliency are in tension with one another. We want to preserve and sustain the things that matter to us, but these things cannot remain unchanged under climate heating pressures. However, we can use meanings to hold this tension together and to make it productive. Using meaning making in collective practical reasoning helps us to expand our understanding of those things we want to sustain. By exploring the meanings underpinning what we value, we increase our knowledge of how these things must change if we are to sustain them. And we can make organisational and economic purposes and practices out of this knowledge, especially when combined with narratives, imaginaries and new technologies. Narratives influence economic behaviour. 
They help us to carry forward a values-led recovery into people's lives and work. They provide a social basis for people who hold to different values to work together on shared problems. Meanings are the fuel for the creation, augmentation and dissemination of narratives. Schiller uses the metaphor of contagions and epidemics to describe the evolution of narratives. But I think this leaves out the agency and power of meaning makers in the co-construction of narratives. It also does not offer us a way to evaluate narratives and promote better economic narratives for sustainability transitions. For example, urgency narratives that rely upon war metaphors in climate change could stimulate insider-outsider categories already so unhelpful in political discourse. We need rather alternative narratives based upon collaboration, care and earth stewardship. However, writing about the nuclear age, Gunther Anders in Language and End Time said that ordinary language was not made for what is enormous. He asks whether it is possible for, for us to create a language that will help us to become fully sensitized to our shared predicament. Moreover, narratives are easily corrupted. We need to be careful what narratives and narrators we legitimate, put, permitting them authority to shape our lives. So alongside contributive justice, I propose that we need narrative justice. A 2018 Royal Society study of narratives and technology argues that human behaviour and flourishing are affected by the narrative ecosystem of artificial intelligence. However, narrative formation often excludes marginalised groups and individuals from authoring narratives or from having their narratives taken up as the accepted version. Depriving narrative formation of the full spectrum of meaning makers has real world effects. For example, recruitment AIs that are coded to reflect conventional models of success freeze our world into existing frames of exclusion. We need new narratives to rebuild our global economy. Re-embedded globalization and de-integration are two useful ideas we could draw upon for such narrative formation. David Held and colleagues describe globalization as a process of widening, deepening and speeding up of worldwide interconnectedness. Building back better national economies that avoid the seductions and traps of autarky means building back a better globalization that does more than serve the interests of a powerful elite and to which we all indirectly contribute harms. We need, we need a globalization that is in service of people and planet and provides all people everywhere with the tools they need to make their contribution to solving planetary challenges that affect their lives and presents risks to what they hold dear. A re-embedded globalization would draw nations into multilateral relationships, but allow governments to intervene in domestic economies. A de-integrated globalization recognizes that complex societies need what Esposito identifies as a sufficient de-integration or, de or a functional differentiation of subsystems that are mutually dependent but have their own criteria of operation. For narrative formation that supports this dual movement, we could consider the metaphor of the fractal. The Fractal Foundation describes a fractal as a never-ending pattern. Fractals are infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across various scales. They are created by repeating a simple process over and over in an ongoing feedback loop. Essentially, a fractal means that each part has the same elements as the whole. In the relation of the local to the global economy, each locality contains essential elements of food supply, energy, water, as well as social elements of values, relationships and ethics. The process element of the fractal is supplied by procedures supporting participatory and deliberative co-design, based upon common principles describing what elements of the whole each part should include in its design. The elements are replicated across each locality. 
The aim is to establish a collaborative governance regime that interlinks with the regimes of other entities, such as nations, regions and cities. However, fractal design represents a challenge to competitive strategies based on specialisation, agglomeration and clustering. It means that people must grapple with the central dilemma of efficiency and resiliency. Managing the dilemma of fractal design requires democratic innovation, focused on open and organised societies that promote the ability of citizens to contribute through their various social roles to complex problems. Recent democratic innovations and experiments have included, for example, platform cooperatives, participatory urban governance and placemaking, multi-stakeholder initiatives in supply chains, deliberative experiments and mini publics such as citizen assemblies. In a values-led recovery, however, democracy has moral significance beyond being a mode of governance. In his essay on the ethics of democracy, John Dewey argues against defining democracy simply as the rule of many, as sovereignty chopped up into mincemeat. He says that this is an abrogation of society, a society dissolved and annihilated. Rather, democratic innovation needs to take place against an understanding of society as a social system. John Dewey understood this when he said that the mass as an aggregate of isolated units is a fiction and society is a real whole and that is how things really are. This real whole is a pluralistic entity with differences of opinion, struggles, only partially organised, not always available to the democratic vocation or even willing to learn, but nonetheless full of human beings and other living creatures and things who are mutually interdependent. So I think about the purpose of democracy in two ways for building the kind of economic strategy we need post-COVID. Firstly, as a platform for societal progress. It provides a setting for people to make their contributions, where those contributions are structured by goods of meaningful work, such as autonomy, freedom and dignity. Secondly, as a people-making project, Democracy makes us into the kinds of people able to make judgments about the range of lives to be lived and who are equipped with the status, capabilities and a moral sensibility of our relations to other beings and things. To achieve this, we need to reform the associational life of the productive economy. The mid-range associational fabric that mediates between citizens and the state is critical for economic recovery. Paul Hurst's work on associative democracy is an example that we could draw upon in which society is orchestrated by voluntary and democratically self-governing associations. Hurst's proposal yields aims, values, principles and practices that are useful for designing economic strategy and for creating an ongoing rebuilding process. With respect to aims, Associative democracy is concerned both with authority within organisations and with decentralised and cooperative governance of the economy as a whole. With respect to values for an, an, an associational ethics, here Paul Hurst's proposal needs amending in the light of COVID-19 to include, for example, a relational ethics of care that extends to more than human worlds. Principles of organisation with democracy as a pathway to knowledge and innovation. And finally, translating into economic practices of cooperation, collaboration and coordination. We're already becoming familiar with these practices as organisations increasingly mobilise together to address climate heating. The rebuilding process needs the support of a policy ecosystem of agreements, practices and measures. The elements of such an ecosystem might include good work and deliberative quality indices, entitlements to capability development, framework for deliberative and representative voice, a diversity of ownership forms within an associative economic democracy, and perhaps also a universal basic income. And I don't think that we should wait for the government to do this policy work for us. We need to claim our capabilities to organise for ourselves and for others. 
to collaborate and experiment within the associational fabric of society that is, after all, ours. I think we should find other levels of society to try out experiments in policy making. For example, voluntary corporate codes, covenants for sectors and supply chains, and city constitutions. So summing up, I am advancing ideas to set in train a recovery rich in life goods. In order to create a participatory, technological and socially enabled ecological civilization, where meanings, knowledge and socio-technical resources are directed to caring for living beings and material things. One that is mediated by a vibrant, inclusive, democratically arranged associational life through which people can make socially valuable complex contributions to life provisioning that helps them experience meaningfulness in life and work. Thank you very much. Wonderful, wonderful talk, Ruth. Thank you very much indeed. Really, really inspiring. Um, let me ask you a few questions first, if I may. And, um, <clears throat> but before I do, I just want to say to everyone who's listening, so one of the important things about this talk is that although Ruth began with the question of, of uh, the impact of COVID-19 in the UK, your job this afternoon is to think about where these ideas will apply in the context you know best, wherever you're situated in the world, because this isn't just a question of what's going on in the UK. <clears throat> so Ruth, one of the things I liked very much was this focus on life meaning and life goods. And I was very struck by it because in the Institute for Global Prosperity, redesigning prosperity for the 21st century is our attempt, at set, in a sense, at crafting a new form of life meaning. And one of the great barriers we have to crafting that new form of life meaning uh, is this problem, exactly as you had identified, of the relationship between ethics and economics. Because sometimes in the societies we live in, economics have seemed like the opposite of ethics. They've seemed like just either the market acting uh, alone and without reference to human desires or human understandings, or it seemed as though there are humans doing very much better than other humans, in some sense using economics to, to get something, to get ahead of themselves. So if we're thinking very practically about how we would rework that relationship between ethics and economics, where, where might we start, do you think? Can you hear me all right? Yes, perfectly. That's good. <laughs> uh, it, it's a tricky question knowing where to start, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And I, I admit that I have been myself around the houses on this. Yeah. And it's a little bit chicken, chicken and egg, and probably my response will reflect that because I, I want to say that we should start where people themselves wish to start. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it's up to people in their localities, you invited yeah. the audience to think about their own locations, yeah. where they are situated in their communities or their workplaces or their society as a whole, to work with other, others to identify the problems that matter to them, mm -hmm. that are crucial to their lives. And I think that to motivate people to do these kinds of changes, to connect ethics and economics, they have to work on something which is highly motivating for them. Yeah. So they must choose. And uh, the task of government, if you like, of public services, of local government, is to equip them with the tools that they need to work on those problems that they have identified as relevant to them. Mm. So it's a, it's a toolkit approach, it's a chicken and egg approach, it's saying starting with those things that people themselves say matter to them, equipping them properly for the task, and then helping them out with it, be an enabling state. We've talked, there, there's been quite a lot of conversation about states being enabling, mm -hmm. but we've not really properly worked out what that would look like. Of course then, it's tricky because what then is the relationship between the citizen and the state in all of in all of that who makes final decisions on where resources are going to go not all experiments are going to be viable uh, but 
we we should level in there i think with some of the the new forms of democratic innovating so we should look at citizens assemblies and deliberative assemblies and look at the way in which local experimentation can feed into some of those wider processes where people have to make collective collective decisions about where, where resources are going to go yes and i think i think that has to be right but it does raise interesting questions about the role of the state exactly as you said and of course this is an area where there has been a very dominant narrative in the last 30 years or so. And it's actually very difficult in many countries in the, of the world to shift that narrative. So if we said, for example, that one of the drivers of the kind of process of, of creating these life goods and these life meanings that you're talking about is narrative. And so we have to, we have to use narratives to do that. But, but at the moment, we're living in a rather schizophrenic place, aren't we? Where one part of the public discussion is saying, we need to regenerate the planet. We need to live within planetary boundaries. We need to rework the relationship between ethics and economics. And another part of it is saying, build a wall. Uh, you know, look out for the national interest. Don't get involved in these things. You know, the, the economy will come back as, as it has before. So the role of the state in this is, 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 is very difficult, I think. And I think this is something that lots of the people listening will be very interested in is how do we get this reform of associational life that you talked about which is so key to pushing that on because we live in times where you know populist narrative at the moment is not a very enabling one mm. Mm. indeed we can only start where we're at Yes. And with respect to the associational life, that is why then I turn to a work mm -hmm. and I turn to the reform of work. In some ways, that's a very traditional view. We've yes. had um, lots of discussion, lots of scholarship, lots of history around the enabling function of work and how it forms us as human beings and gives us skills and capabilities. And I think we need to re-look re -look at work and we need to rethink it in the, in the light of the possibilities that democratic innovation may afford us. Mm. And really now, grasp this nettle of thinking about the democratic organization of that associational infrastructure and to do that properly particularly here in the uk that's a difficulty in some other uh, nation states we that th th they're a little bit ahead of the game with us because uh, germany of course has its system of co-determination in other parts of europe there are uh, mutual and cooperative economies with uh, co-owned organizations with their own internal democracy which yeah. helps them but we do have resources here in the uk that we can we can draw upon and other countries do as well so it's it's starting from where we are, but it's also auditing what democratic resources each, each location has got. Yeah. So we understand in each location what it is that people have got to build with and to set the general objective that people's working lives should, be, should become more democratically organized and that people's lives in their communities also should afford them opportunities to engage with deliberation over the the local issues that matter to them yeah. so i think it, there's an element of recognizing where we're at there's an element of recognizing what the objective is which is a more demo democratically arranged associational life and then to fill the gap some kind of an audit that would unearth the already existing resources that are there everywhere and the bit about narratives and uh, the corruption of narratives, of course, that's extremely important to think about. And we're not in a very good state at the moment with respect to how we actually manage and uh, promote healthy narratives that will enable people to do the things that they want to do to manage their lives and to solve their shared problems. But again, we can only start with, with where we're at. Uh, we, we know that people are equipped with all kinds of technologies that are enable them to participate in narrative formation. Yes, we certainly do have a problem with the way that uh, groups are splintered one from the other. But I think, again, if we worked if we worked out what are the what are the collective problems that people really wish to work on locally within their own spheres in work and in their communities this would help people to actually start to think about what are the meanings and narratives that they would need that would overcome the divisions because 
one would have to hope that the nature of the problem and the urgency of the problem will be such that it will help people to overcome some of their differences. Now that is a hope. Uh, of course, we know very well it doesn't always happen, but um, we, we have to try for some kind of a beginning and some kind of a provisioning, provisioning of people with the tools and equipment that they need so that they can actually start to work together on those shared problems. Yeah. And also, I think if it starts with something that's that's a priority for the local community as well, that's really important. So if it's something like toxic water supply or if it's other something that's very concrete, then this would chime perhaps well with what you've said. But thinking about work as being central to this, you did make a distinction in your talk between what you called meaningful work. And, and a phrase that's been used much more frequently in discussions in the last sort of five or six years, and that's decent work, yeah? So I wondered if you'd just say a little bit more about how you see that difference between decent work and meaningful work. So with respect to meaningful work, uh, there's a lot more emphasis which is, which is placed upon the, the voice element of work. Mm -hmm. Decent work yeah. does contain voice it has got that element in there but meaningful work and the prospects for people to be able to experience meaningfulness in work and then to be able to incorporate that into the meaningfulness of their lives as a whole hmm. depends upon a particular status that they have as co-producers of meanings mm -hmm. and also their capabilities to mm -hmm. exercise that capability in uh, interactions with others. Mm -hmm. So meaningful work places a lot more emphasis upon the capacities and abilities and the status of people to engage in co-construction of meanings and to be involved in the uh, evaluation of those meanings in their work and in their lives because as I mentioned in the talk not all meanings are ethically viable and we have to choose some and um, discard others and so meaningful work places a lot more emphasis uh, upon that aspect of uh, something which is morally viable and something which is emotionally engaging and that people can collectively agree uh, contributes to some kind of a, a common good or something of, of universal value beyond themselves. Yeah. Decent work doesn't necessarily lay as much emphasis upon the, the moral dimension of work. Yeah, no, no, I see, I see that. It's a very helpful, very helpful distinction. And so the other thing I enjoyed very much was your emphasis at the beginning about um, practical idealism and of course as we all know change is impossible without practical idealism you have to have a practical idealism to make change of any kind uh, move or stick or you know take form and shape and have power and and so on and it, it struck me that one of the ways in which you were trying to do that was by using a phrase provisioning economy and so I wondered if you, in, in doing that, not so much that you would talk more about provisioning economy, although please do if you'd like to, but I wanted to actually turn that question around a little bit, especially for the audience this evening, and just say, is that for you where the real value of, of, of uh, a university comes, of the kind of debates of intellectual life, that one can create these kinds of concepts that then begin to take hold in a very powerful way, like, for example, provisioning economy? Yes. I agree. I think that universities have got a really important role to play in enlarging people's imaginations mm -hmm. and to give them a, a fresh vocabulary, mm -hmm. uh, give them some fresh concepts and a playground, mm -hmm. an opportunity to enter into realms that in their normal lives and in their normal work, they perhaps would not have the chance to uh, enter and ideas that they would would feel they couldn't quite play with and they couldn't quite explore because it wasn't allowed. Mm -hmm. So I think that universities are extremely important for imagination, for playfulness and for people to have permission to explore new areas. However, I, I would say that it's not exclusively uh, um, universities and that universities are fed by those people who come to its students, supporters, practitioners, um, the general public, and that universities themselves need to be fed by the outside. 
and also that workplaces and communities are not devoid of the opportunities for enlarged imagination, that there needs to be a continual flow of imaginative thinking uh, throughout society, with the university certainly playing a, a key and pivotal role, but open itself to influence and being willing to see how um, other parts of society are equally fruitful for uh, the emergence of new ideas and for experimentation with ideas. And uh, in the end, of course, if the university is to mean anything at all, then what we do has to be taken up in the other spheres of society. And in some ways, society is, is, is casting a judgment upon the ideas that come forth from the university uh, setting and say, well, these ones are, are viable. These are gonna work. These ones I'm afraid are, are not. They, they, they give us the tasks that we have to do. And we need yeah. to listen openly to what uh, people say to us. Great. Well, I'm sure lots of my colleagues will pick that up, especially in relation to the citizen science work and the community work that we do in the IGP. Um, but we're going to open it up now to the uh, to the to, to, to the, all the listeners and to all the attendees, of whom there are very many, uh, and get their views and responses. Um, so uh, I've got a question that's been sent through to me from Jackie McGlade, who's thanking you for your excellent talk, but also asking, can you say something about meaningfulness? when the speed of change does not allow time to develop coherence in the values and in the narratives? Uh, yes. Um, well, actually, uh, that's an extremely interesting and important point. So I say yes, but I haven't necessarily got a fully worked out response. Right. I think that speed is extremely important to consider here. Um, how we might do it, I suppose, is to think about what is the nature of deliberation in a cognitive sense. So we do have some resources here, I, I understand, the sort of thinking slow and thinking fast, mm -hmm. and the way in which we could uh, deliberately choose to slow down some of these thinking and reflecting processes so that we give ourselves and we give each other a little bit more space and time to reflect upon what is happening to us and to think about the nature of the meanings that are coming forth and whether they are indeed viable for uh, the problems that we have to solve together. So I so it, I guess it's, it's a matter of saying, well, what are the processes that we would craft so that we can maximize our opportunities to reflect, to slow things down just that little bit, to allow for those different cognitive pathways to, um, to be activated. And I guess there are numerous ways in which that could be done. And we, we have some of those already, of course. And I think it would then be up to uh, people in organ at an organizational level to think about, well, how would we craft um, a, a thinking slow type of experience with our employees so that we could reflect maybe upon strategic or uh, other kinds of challenges and uh, deliberately build into uh, governance and into the process is that people have got together some kind of an opportunity for people to trigger uh, the thinking slow as well as the thinking fast um, mm -hmm. pathways that uh, seem to be universal in all of us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've got another question coming through from Johnny Stormont Darling, who's asking uh, or saying promoting complexity means promoting uncertainty. And how best do we foster an appetite or tolerance for uncertainty amongst both politicians and the public? Mm. Mm. Another really excellent question, um, which ought to stimulate, together with the, the question on uh, um, speed, mm. uh, ought to stimulate a, a whole range of new proposals about the kinds of practices that people you would use when they come together again to solve those those complex challenges so i think that there perhaps is an, an opportunity here to collate these ideas if you like whether they're they're to do with speed or they're to do with the corruption of narratives or whether they're to do with the integration of meanings and the, the concerns that people have a, around complexity and say well what could we do to help people understand complexity by bringing to bear uh, intelligence, data, technology, resources, that toolkit 
mm-hmm. they're upon the problems that they identify as relevant to them. Now, that's not going to get rid of people's fear of things going wrong. No. Uh, we are mutually vulnerable. We are bound together. There is there is no condition that has ever been uh, between human beings where we're not mutually vulnerable to one another. Um, but the, the nature of, of complexity could be unpacked by helping people with, uh, w- by helping people to attend to shared problems and to use new technologies and to use uh, new kinds of socio-technical practices so that they can actually see that those those complexities are manageable, that they're not beyond their realm, their sphere of control. And I think this is, this of course is where it starts to break down. If people feel that it's beyond their control, then they are going to experience fear, they're going to experience anxiety, and they will uh, demonstrate resistance to what needs to take place in terms of the relevant changes. Mm -hmm. But if people can have a sense that they are able to work with others to solve those problems, to contain them, to have a sense of agency in the midst of all of that uncertainty, uh, then we start to be able to break down the barriers between people and we start to be able to make them open to the kinds of uh, new toolkits that might be made available to them. Yes, well, that's good. And so now we've got a two-parter, so I'm going to ask it in two parts. Um, It's a question from Chris Harker, and he's asking the first part, how does meaning how does a sort of meaningfulness encounter deal with algorithmic life so because algorithmic life both fixes meaning as you mentioned and then of course bypasses other meanings so once other things then become outside the algorithm so how do you how does the meaningfulness deal with this algorithmic life is it it intrinsically again in contrast to it Hmm. um I don't know enough about algorithms to be able to answer (laughs) that question fully. But what I'm going to speculate is that it might be possible for us to build into the algorithm a point of review. So we might be able to say, okay, the algorithm runs for whatever period of time or whatever uh, over whatever set of tasks. And then there's a point at which it must be reviewed. Hmm. And maybe it's reviewed, um, it reviews itself, maybe in collaboration with us. Hmm. Maybe we can somehow turn it into a reflective mode where it has to take in insights from outside of itself. I'm assuming here that the artificial intelligence is is going to become somehow intelligent in in some way. And uh, so we need to find a, a point at which we give it its own reflective resources and it becomes available and open to what we have to tell it about how we experience it. Mm. I think perhaps it might then become, if that was possible, I don't know whether that's technically possible, perhaps uh, the, um, the the person who asked the question knows more than I do about that. <laughs> but perhaps then it become built into so, some of those other things that I mentioned that we we all will need uh, reflective spaces in which we can we can start to feel a sense of agency over the uncertainties and complexities mm-hmm. that we need to be able to trigger the sort of slow and thinking pathways mm-hmm. that we need to do that so that we can access um, the, the toolkit that might be available to us to be able to tackle shared problems and the artificial intelligences moment of reflection could be combined with our own uh, Mm. so that we are then working together and it needs us and we need it. Mm. So that's a vision of empathy between between the humans and the artificial intelligence. I rather like that. But the second part of Chris's question was, so how does the meaningfulness encounter deal with the sort of effective atmospheres of the present, which are very much uh, uh, characterized by forms of either sort of checking out or by boredom or by disengagement. I mean, how do we deal with those difficult issues? People saying, you know, I can't be bothered. Yeah, yes. Um, th- there is some work that Tatiana Schnell did, which is very interesting on um, existential indifference. Uh-huh. And uh, she she had a look at the way in which uh, there may be a, a portion of the population that's entirely indifferent to mm. whether or not they've, they have meaning in life and meaning in work. Mm. And I think that uh, that 
that type of um, psychology needs to be taken very seriously, of course. Um, it needs to be considered as, uh, as relevant to the kinds of questions that I raised in, in, my, in my discussion. Mm -hmm. And I think that we, we need to uh, think about then how existential indifference might arise from a, a kind of process of adaptive preferences, which may arise from the way in which the circumstances in which people find themselves um, sort of iron out their sense of adventure, their sense of imagination, their sense that actually if they were to do anything to find their lives and work to be meaningful, there really would not be any point because they would not, they would not succeed. Oh. With respect to boredom specifically, oh. I think boredom can be very useful. Mm. I think that uh, if people are, are feeling a bit you know, fed up, um, maybe even mildly depressed, mm -hmm. uh, turned off, alienated, if you like, it actually provides uh, a, a chance for people to reflect. It, because it's painful. It hurts a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. And it provides an opportunity for people to say, OK, this is this is essentially not working. It's not working in my life. It's not working in my uh, with my colleagues. And it provides a chance for us as, as individuals to reflect upon um, what meanings are important to us and how they might be incorporated into our lives differently. In the workplace, I think that boredom collectively, collective boredom perhaps, and you, you might all be, all be experiencing this right now for all I know, collective boredom uh, may be a fantastic opportunity for an organisation to to, to, to press the pause button mm -hmm. and to say okay we need to do something here to think about our collective situation and why it is that uh, we we no longer feel as motivated as we have been around the things that we have been doing it might need a, a fundamental rethink of the purposes and practices of the of the organization uh, so i think boredom can be useful both individually and collectively oh, great now, the next question is from Nikolai Minchev, but Nikolai can ask his question to you live, actually, so he's going to do that because he, he's one of the panelists. Nikolai. Yeah. Thank you, Henriette, and uh, thanks, Ruth. Um, my question is fairly close to Chris's question about the algorithm, and that is, what is your view on social media and the kinds of meanings and the forms of discourse that are generated and circulated on social media platforms? Because nowadays everyone is on their phone on Twitter and Facebook, and there's a lot of political discussion that's taking place on these platforms. But I think that very little of that discussion is about meaningful themes, such as meaningful work or decent work. So I just wanted to ask for your, your view on that. Mm -hmm. It's such a massive problem, isn't it? And a social media which ought to be a fabulous tool for uniting us all together, is now settling us all into individual tribes where we just throw insults at each other. And uh, there's, there's a, a real degradation of a public discourse in, in social media. So again, I'm not sure if I have entirely the answer to this because I tend to feel then that given how difficult it is for people to engage with social media, perhaps, sorry, it's not difficult to engage in social media, but you know what I mean in the sense that it can become degraded, that we need to start from elsewhere, that we need to look outside of, of social media and look in the, in the places where we live and we work. And then once we can see what is happening around us, say, well, what then do we want social media to do for us when we are working or living together with others and maybe where we have also identified those problems which, which we wish collectively to, to tackle, what then is the kind of social media that we need to help us to do that living together, to help us to do that working together, to help us to do that problem solving? So start from outside and get the tool reformed so that it can work with those things that we, we want to do. I don't think it'll ever get rid of the problem. I think that there is also always going to be some um, concern around the way in which social media can so swiftly be turned to division, um, to um, all of the, the behaviours that we see, which are so unhelpful. And for then, we probably also need a regulatory framework, as well yeah. as the norms and, and ethics and behavioural modes that go with that. 
yeah. brings us back a little bit to the role of the state, which connects to the next question. So you're getting very good questions, Ruth. With, with people really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much. So this next question is from Saffron uh, Woodcraft. Uh, and she's asking if she could ask a question about how to generate the kinds of narratives or imaginaries that engage the private sector in the citizen state relationship, because the IGP's work on understanding the impact of inclusive growth strategies or policies observes the disconnect between public and private sector actors. And so what forms of local democratic innovation can bring business, community and state into dialogue with each other? So bring business in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Which is essential, of course. Mm. And if, if any attempt is going to be made to reform the associational fabric uh, along the lines that I talked about, mm. then it's all of its parts. It's par private, public and civic. And the kinds of problems that people might wish to work on together are going to need again all those kinds of organizations to cooperate and collaborate. In some ways, I, I feel um, less concerned about incorporating the private sector because it, it seems to me that there's already an awful lot of goodwill mm -hmm. and, and an awful lot of appetite to, to, for, of the private sector to do something in order to solve those, those problems that people have got mm -hmm. uh, collectively. And I think that we can see some of the evidence for that in the way in which corporations have um, put together sectoral groups and multi-stakeholder initiatives in supply chains. And of course, a lot of that is driven by corporate interest. And there would be those of my colleagues in, uh, who, are, who are democratic theorists who would say that it's not possible for us to have a, a truly democratic experience if corporations are going to be running the deliberative space because they'll run it according to their own interests with their corporate power being applied etc etc uh, but on the other hand I also tend to feel that this this is the beginning of something larger I mean these organizations are learning how to incorporate other stakeholders into these types of initiatives that they are doing that um, in, in multiple arenas not only out there in global supply chains but also in uh, more more local settings in urban place make, making initiatives and there is just I think a bit of a turning point here as uh, corporations understand that they must do something if they are going to mitigate their own risks. So it comes back to their own interests. Uh, there's a concern that they have that they are mutually vulnerable together with us to climate heating pressures but a whole range of other pressures and they are also uh, members of society and uh, they, I, I think if we think about organizations as made up of people, uh, there are, are people in organizations who have a, a sense of connection to other groups and other parts of society beyond the boundaries of the, of, of the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an awful lot of interest now in the movement of capital towards sustainability ob objectives. And I, I don't feel quite so concerned about that particular one. I, I think we're starting to see the beginnings of a big shift. Okay, well, that's good. And we have a question now from Anton Kutuzov, who's saying, do you think that a part of the meaningfulness crisis is due to the imbalance in, the, in modern society between rights and responsibility? To elaborate, the narrative of rights, both their infringement and otherwise, far outweighs the narrative of responsibility, leading to people struggling to motivate themselves to look inward with care and help locally. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. The, the language of rights has somehow become eroded, and it's a great shame because it has been a, a, a massive force for good during the course of the 20th century. But we seem to need to revisit uh, the, the language of rights in, in the 21st century. And I don't think we're entirely without resources here. Um, I wonder if there's something that we could do in relation to duties. Mm -hmm. And we could also, we could perhaps almost argue that we have a right to our duties. <laughs> yeah. That we have, because, because we need, I, mean, I think it was Joseph Rouse, the philosopher, that talked wow. about duties as being humanizing. Mm 
Mm. But by having duties, it shows us that we have connections to other people. We have relationships that matter. We have things that are important for us to do. Uh, we have uh, the opportunity to make those contributions, which I talked about. And so we have a right to our duties, to duties that help us to look after other uh, beings and things. And because we have that right to our duties and to fulfill our duties and our responsibilities, then we need to be equipped. We need to have the capabilities, we need to have the resources, we need to have that toolkit that I mentioned so that we can actually fulfill our responsibilities and enact our duties. And the next question, and I can't, I'm afraid to say I can't, it's from Paul, but I can't see the full name because of the way it's come through to me. But Paul, I apologize for that. And he's asking the way the financial system works, both in the UK and globally, is a key driver in our current economy and society. And how much of a barrier is the financial system to the aim of building back better and to a rich, uh, a recovery rich in life goods? And are there other key barriers to change in your view? Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, <Good. laughs> this is a big topic. Yes. And perhaps it links to some of the earlier comments that I made about uh, the shift of capital Mm -hmm. uh, towards um, sustainability problems and challenges. Mm -hmm. And if we could, again, in the interests of that capital that wishes to mitigate its own risks and vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And this is perhaps how we could think about um, the financial sector. To, I know the financial sector is bigger than uh, capital investment. So mm -hmm. we, we need to think of it in the round. In the round. Yeah. And perhaps one of the things that's been alluded to here is the, the nature of people who are the, the, the people who manage capital, who are financiers. Uh, it's a particular kind of way of being in the world uh, that is actually proving to be rather unhelpful uh, because it seems to set people up into striving competition with one another. Uh, it it um, drives them towards accumulation, over accumulation, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't enable them to reflect upon well, what is this accumulation for? What are we uh, generating all these financial assets for? And then, uh, if we think about the sort of wider monetary system with the the circulations of money and assets and all the rest of it, you know, where is it? Where is it circulating towards? Again, how, how do we find a way of directing money flows and the behavior of people who work in these sectors towards the kinds of uh, progressive outcomes that we need globally? It, needs, it does, in the end, probably need that kind of change in ethical sensibility, which again, I talked about, which is something that needs to happen um, in, in all persons, but will be reflected differently depending upon what, sh what occupational group the people are in. So those who work in, in the fields of finance and capital uh, would need to have a, a kind of subjectivity which uh, reflects the work that they have to do, the work that we want them to do, um, and which makes them into the kinds of people who will be able to administer money on our behalf uh, in order to achieve the goals that we collectively want to achieve with respect to climate ch change and, and other challenges. Yes. Yeah, I think, must, I, think, I think that must be the case because we do need a massive change in the flow of finance, for example, for green energy transition, because it isn't just a matter of a few wind farms, even though we've been recently told that here in the UK. There's much more to it than that. And there is a fundamental issue, uh, which I know your work on mutuality addresses, which is the relationship between what you might broadly call a shareholder economy and a stakeholder economy. So it's it's a it's a very tough one, isn't it? It's a very it's a very very yes. very very tough question. But I'm not allowed to hog the floor at this time, so I have to let another person ask you a question. And the next question is actually from uh, Matt Davis, and he's also able to uh, ask it live. So Matt, could you please do that? Thanks, Henrietta, and thanks, Ruth. It was a wonderfully rich talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I, I wasn't really interested in this tension that you identified between maintenance and change, which you sort of uh, framed as sustainability versus resilience. 
and and it seems to me that much much life uh, political life in particular is caught between sort of polarized positions of maintenance versus change and that instead of becoming conversations about what we should keep and what we should change they become these polarized competing ideologies one attached to change and one attached to uh, to maintenance and stasis. And I just wondered if you had more thoughts or could elaborate on how you might productively reframe that tension to get beyond it. Mm. Yes, it, it's one, I mean, you've picked it up and it is extremely helpful. And it's also tied to that uh, earlier slide that I had at the beginning about belonging and uh, how we actually need to create a, a sense of ourselves both locally rooted and also globally interconnected and it connects also to the sort of re-globalization slide that I had too. Um, I think that one of the ways in which I've thought about this, this tension is to, is to think well um, people who might sit on different sides of a problem I don't really like to sort of think about sides because it's more of in the end it always seems to be more of a circle once you start exploring things with people the perspectives that they bring are, are very varied they don't necessarily neatly divide up into we're in this camp one or in this camp two uh, so there's there's a whole variety of perspectives that can be unearthed when when looking at a particular challenge but I think that in terms of process and procedure, one of the ways in which we might do it is to look at values. And if you want to think about it as camp one and camp two, uh, they might adhere to uh, two different uh, meaning, uh, values systems, if you like. And those value systems will, will contain all kinds of different sorts of meanings. And those meanings will be derived from all different sorts of sources, such as history and culture and experience and, uh, you know, my fears, your fears, uh, our individual and our collective uh, experiences in the past and what we imagine will be happening in the future. And I think if there was a, a, a richer discussion about what the, what the values systems are, but not only that, also the, the meanings that underpin that, then we might be able to start to unearth some shared ground. Now, shared ground is not the same as we agree. It is still a ground of diversity and pluralism. But those who are in camp one actually might find that um, they have concerns which are, are fairly similar to camp two. It's just that they express them through different kinds of values. And if, if indeed some shared ground could be identified, then I think that is extremely helpful for rendering the tension between maintaining and changing, rendering that tension more productive. In the end, I do rely upon the procedure and uh, there will be those who will disagree with that and say you can't just rely upon on the procedure. But I suppose that uh, along with uh, the, the whole history of this in terms of participatory democracy and um, a process driven organizational design and all the rest of it, there's, there's no getting away from having to start in one place and end up at another. There's got to be some kind of a procedure. There's got to be some kind of a process. So let's just make it as rich as possible, tr uh, as many voices as possible. Try not to make it go too fast, but also understanding that there needs to be a point of ending and decision. Uh, it, it, the question actually ties in with the rest of the discussion that we've we've been having. Uh, it's, they they all they are all in the round together. Great. So now we have another question uh, from Bogdan Goranianu, who's asking: How can a narrative focused on value, meaning, and care in economy become a dominant story, in light of findings from psychological science that suggests that sort of dark triad personalities? that may not have the capacities to appreciate such concepts are attracted and unfortunately tend to reach leadership roles in dominance hierarchies that end up having a significant role in influencing society. Uh, yes, um, I, I agree. This is, this is very tricky. And uh, I think that I think that re with respect to that kind of psychology, the way that I think about it is that we once had an honor code and we had dignity, for example, that was tied towards um, honor 
um, being able to show one's status in, uh, in, in society. And we don't have that quite so much now. I'm not saying it's disappeared and it hasn't disappeared everywhere, but it, it is no longer as dominant that we've been able to change in terms of our interactions with one another and in terms of what we emphasize out of the, of the kind of repertoire of human behavior. So the repertoire of human behavior is probably what it is. Mm -hmm. And we can probably nail that down and describe it. And indeed that is the task of psychology. But I think that where we have choices is in emphasizing some modes of behavior over an, another. And I do take hope from the fact that we have somehow changed our behavior somewhat as human beings, that dignity is now tied to a notion of equal human worth and not the honor code. And, uh, and so it seems to me that this provides us with, a, with a, a history of our own to draw upon, how we can indeed create narratives of change, which are about changing human behavior by emphasizing different types of human behavior that exist within our repertoire. Very good. So now we come to the last question finally, and thank you for answering so many questions uh, this, this evening. So the last question is from Harry Ortiz Venejas, and he's asking, how do you imagine the future of new institutions that actually promote the democratization of knowledge and doing? What will their future be? And he's referring here to the ones that we've proposed in, in what's called the Transforming Tomorrow Initiative in the IGP, which you probably don't know about, but we can talk about it later, and how to ensure these universal access to these kinds of new institutions. So what will their future be, do we think? What direction will they take? I think it's extremely important that we should have a vision of what new institutions look like and their characteristics. Yeah. So I'm really glad that there is work out there that has been done. Mm -hmm. uh, in my own work, I've taken a more sort of philosophical line, so you'll forgive me, and uh, two characteristics which I've, I've identified for these new institutions. And I take a very broad view of what institutions are, actually. I include all, the ho a whole range of organizations under the category. Mm -hmm. um, I say they need to be characterized by integrity and by empathy and I make an argument that both of those characteristics uh, can be institutionalized and regulated and monitored for at a, a governance level and uh, that uh, it provides us with an, both of those characteristics are clues to whether those those institutions and those organizations are what I call collective moral agents in that they're able to fulfill their responsibilities to all of their various stakeholders. Uh, so that's, that's how I've been thinking about the kinds of um, institutions that we need to see in order for those characteristics to be realized, then we need to have some of those other things that I've been talking about, which is um, a democratized organizational life, which is institutionally anchored embedded within a, an associational ecosystem which also has its uh, its its modes of participation and um, I also broaden the idea of the stakeholder and the member of the organization so in order to get at this aspect of are we finishing no 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 carry on um, in order to get at this aspect of um, complex work and yeah. contributive justice, then I say that we need to have new modes of membership to organizations. So we, we maybe could actually uh, start to think about ways in which people could be associated with organizations that they are interested in, because those organizations are um, situated in those complex problems that people wish to solve that they have chosen to solve collectively and so so if they're in their kind of ecosystem of problem solving then that might entitle them to some form of associate membership of shell of uh, yeah. whoever else it may be yeah. and that they could have there, there might be all kinds of ways that could be done through observer status mm -hmm. maybe even some kind of uh, voting status mm. and that there could be more voices then that are leveled in upon the organization uh, that is then stimulated to manifest these characteristics of integrity and empathy because of the very wide diversity of people who show an interest yeah. in them becoming collective moral agents yeah 
no, that's, ex that's, that's extremely important, I think. And the embedded nature of these new institutions is going to be absolutely key. So we've come um, <clears throat> to the end of, of this, this evening's uh, talk and, and question and answer session. Um, and thank you, Ruth, very much for a wonderful talk and, and great answers to really very, very difficult um, questions. Um, <clears throat> and we can't have everyone around us because of the circumstances. And we're very sorry about that because we would have loved to have seen you in person at the IGP. We will find another opportunity to do that. But right now, those of us who can, because we're, we're live, are just going to give you a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> no, not at all. And thank you, everyone, for a first wonderful seminar. And please make sure that you're at the next one and see you next week for the first soundbite. Thank you very much to everyone. <laughs>